Hello, hello once again, my audience. So today I want to continue my video series on China. China's been a bit of a chestnut. It's been a bit of a chestnut to crack. And the reason I say that is because it's got a lot of history. But I've decided to change my tact a little bit because I simply don't have time to get through thousands of pages on the imperial history. So I'm just going to be a little bit more pertinent to the point. So something that we hear all the time China is going to rule the world. All the time I hear this. China has the best economy, they say. It's growing fast. They have the biggest military. Two million Chinaman ready to go boom. But this is just wrong. It's a joke. Every time I hear it, I cringe. I die a little bit inside. It's like someone is showing me the hairy armpit of some rather unattractive lady. I was for a time reading about ancient Chinese history, but there's so many dynasties and the place is so big. I just don't think it's worth learning. So what we'll focus on instead is key takeaways, key summary points. I use various books. The best summary was written by someone named Henry Kissinger on China. I'm sure you might have heard of this guy. I read about him before during the oil shocks and the American diplomacy in the Gulf and Persia in the 1970s. So I'm quite familiar with him. Regardless of what some people say about him, the guy was very clever, rest in peace. And his book is excellent. It's also a great reference for other good books. I probably mentioned it before in some of my other videos. There are a lot of bad books out there. There are a lot of books out there written by people who just know how to memorize dates and names. And these books are useless. They do not contain any takeaways or common denominators between events. And that makes it very frustrating to study such histories. So, on to the key takeaways. Firstly, China has never been a warrior civilization. The aristocracy was literary bureaucrats. They gained their positions by sitting and passing state examinations starting about 1,000 years ago. And it seems like not much has changed. Do you ever wonder why Chinese rice calculator is so good at exams? Some of that time was also spent learning how to cheat exams as well. Don't trust their statistics. But China's aristocratic roots are in stark contrast to European aristocracy. In the case of the French, which gained its lands and assets and even tax exemptions by military prowess and contribution to the state in medieval times. Quite simply, what I'm arguing here is that for a country, a civilization, to be able to conquer other lands, it needs to have some kind of martial or military history, which I argue China does not have. Key takeaway number two, China has always seen itself at the center of the world. And this is Chinese exceptionalism, even to its own detriment. When the empire was strong, the cultural sphere of influence expanded. But never did China attempt to conquer surrounding regions in a meaningful sense. It never espoused the American notion of universalism to spread its values around the world. Instead, China sought to maintain the great harmony democratically with tribute-paying states like Korea, Thailand, and Vietnam. And this tribute wasn't to pay China taxes. It wasn't necessarily a net gain for China. In fact, peoples who prostrated themselves in front of the emperor often arrived modestly and left generously. When it came to Europe, China cared little. Hong Wu, the founder of the Ming Dynasty in the wake of the Yuan's collapse, asked a simple question. If China is number one, and God wanted China to influence the world as number one, why put Europe so far away? As he said himself, they come to us across the seas. It is difficult for them to calculate the year and month of arrival. Regardless, we treat them on the principle of those who arrive modestly and leave generously. Now, China is a big land. It's comparable in size to the United States. And it is surrounded on all sides by barbarians, more or less. So China controlled these barbarians on its borders by using diplomacy to incentivize peace and mutually beneficial relationships, investing in preeminent princes and leaders with generous gifts, trade rights, and fancy titles. China did not view these barbarians, these uh, Manchus, Mongols, Jurchen, as equals to its other neighboring tributary states like Korea, Vietnam, or Thailand. Barbarians were handled by so-called court of dependencies, whereas Korea and Vietnam were ministered by the Ministry of Rituals. The tributary states were clearly viewed as more important to the great hegemony than the barbarians themselves. And this had varying degrees of success. 
Generally, the neighboring barbarians were better warriors, they were better armed, and more mobile than the Chinese. In times of imperial discord, these barbarians, in combination with discontent or usually unpaid Chinese military leaders, would roll into China and take over. This happened during the Liao, Jin, Yuan, and Qing dynasties. I haven't done the math, but close to half of China's imperial history has been ruled by non-Han. To the south and east of China existed tenacious peoples with significant martial traditions and national identities. The most competent of them, the Vietnamese, have a long history of resisting and even besting China in warfare, and that actually carries up to modern day. I believe the last conflict was in 1975. Although, probably for a lack of material want, and maybe horses as well, they never saw fit to conquer China like the northern barbarians did. So in addition to uh, diplomatic tactics of uh, divide and conquer, China did also make a big wall on the north of China. I'm sure you've heard of it, but it wasn't a perfect solution. You see, nomads, known for their ability to survive long periods without food and water owing to their animal source diets, could travel around it. While lacking militarily, China is quite skilled at diplomacy, however. China generally used a mixture of diplomatic and economic instruments to draw potential problematic foreigners into relationships that could be managed. China also cultivated an image of awesome omnipotence, owing both to its wealth and sheer economic size and ability to do so. Oftentimes, nomadic leaders were permitted or encouraged to fight each other by the imperial court. But even when China was conquered by foreigners, the sheer size and weight of the Chinese bureaucracy and the country itself made it impossible to enact meaningful change, especially in the case of the Yuan Mongols. They soon found themselves seduced by the material allures and political intrigues of the Chinese court, becoming scenified and alienating their Mongol allies back in the home country. As a Han Dynasty scholar put it in 200 CE, the emperor does not govern the barbarians. Those who come will not be rejected, and those who leave will not be pursued. The objective was a compliant, divided periphery, rather than one under direct Chinese control. Key takeaway number three. China has never showed any interest to conquer foreign lands, lay territorial claims, or even start colonies. This has changed in the last 50 years with the rise of Chinese real estate acquisitions courtesy of the CCP across the Western world, especially in populous cities, but colonies that directly take over foreign lands are not part of the Chinese vocabulary, in contrast to European colonies across the New World. Looking back at Imperial China, there is little interest shown in such activities. I will point out two exceptions, the Yuan Dynasty's double attempt to invade Japan in 1274 and 1281, which is not really relevant for obvious reasons because the leaders were Mongolian and not Han Chinese, and the second would be the treasure ship fleets of Admiral Zheng He which is quite an interesting odyssey in and of itself. As characters go, Zhang was pretty strange. He was a Chinese Muslim eunuch who set out with some 300 ships between 1405 and 1433 to spread the news of China's majesty, invitations for foreign leaders to visit China to pay tribute and leave enriched with exotic wares. He sailed all over Asia and as far as the Red Sea, China's naval technology was world-class between 1000 and 1400 CE. It even dwarfed the Spanish Armada, which was still some 150 years away. But with the second emperor of Ming, the fleet was dismantled and records largely destroyed for reasons not quite clear. The expeditions were never repeated, and 1433 marked the high point of Chinese naval supremacy. Ming didn't even attempt to control the waters around China from piracy. The Japanese Waco pirates, inspiration to the manga One Piece, sprang up in the wake of the attempted Yuan invasion of China, and heavily raided the coastal areas of China and Korea until the 1600s. In fact, the Ming banned foreign trade and forced coastal villages to move inland, a somewhat nonsensical solution. But we can see from this how the aristocracy of China viewed itself culturally. China is number one. We won't even bother ourselves with foreigners who are like gnats upon the fleece of the Great Panda. But even when foreigners did prevail in battle against the Chinese, the bureaucratic elite would offer their services and appeal to the conquerors on the premise that such a vast and unique land as they had could be ruled only by use of existing methods, language, and bureaucracy. With each passing generation, the barbarians would find themselves increasingly assimilated into the order they sought to dominate. They could then be convinced to serve Chinese interests by the court. It's somewhat subversive, but highly effective. These tactics didn't work so well when the Europeans turned up, however. 
China's tactics of pitting the foreigners against each other came to an abrupt halt in their effectiveness when the white man arrived. You see, Whitey wasn't so easily fooled into such divide-and-conquer politics, and his armaments greatly exceeded what the home of gunpowder had achieved in the millennia since its creation. At the close of the 1700s, China reached the pinnacle of imperial greatness. The Qing, or Qing Dynasty, as I call it, had been established by northeastern Manchu tribes, and they had managed to combine Manchu and Mongol military prowess and the bureaucratic prowess of Han China in administering vast regions, and had turned China into a major military power. It expanded territory into Mongolia, Tibet, and northwest China, today known as Xinjiang. But let's be honest, these regions are not exactly heavily populated, so I wouldn't particularly classify these as serious territorial expansions. But such success and wealth attracted attention of the newly minted European navies. The trade companies of Dutch land and Britain, high off pepper, exotic spices and silk, wanted to take China for all it had. Instead of uncivilized barbarians, China now faced a foe that did not desire the mandate of heaven for itself, but rather to impose its own values, a new vision of imperial world order, to replace the xenocentric one and a diplomatic system that viewed China more as a partner and less as a supreme entity. In terms of foreign trade, China saw itself to have everything and need nothing. They had a similar approach to Japan's Senkoku policy and Dejim Port. Access to the Chinese market was limited to tightly regulated trade at Guangzhou, also known as Canton. Trade could only take place via licensed local merchants, and it was forbidden to teach the West Sea barbarians any language or history. Furthermore, they were required to leave during winter and return only in the spring. This greatly vexed the European merchants, as you would expect. But one exception was made for the Western powers, and this was for Imperial Russia. China permitted Russia to found an Orthodox Church mission in Beijing in 1715. This was the first foreign mission of its kind for over a century. But this was purely because Russia's imperial expansion placed its territories on China's doorstep. For China, it was simply another form of barbarian diplomacy. As the 1700s drew to a close, the Europeans were becoming impatient with China. Britain, the land of the red-haired barbarians, noted China's antiquated military, still primarily using bows and arrows, and its non-existent navy. Britain had shown success, taking India in 1757, and there was a strong sentiment to keep the ball rolling. In 1793, Britain sent Lord George McCartney to China, a notable, well-conceived, non-militaristic attempt to achieve free trade and equal diplomatic representation. The McCartney mission was intended to make China understand that Britain was no longer an irrelevant land far to the west, that its cultural achievements and its technology were on par or exceeded those of China. To demonstrate, the McCartney mission brought numerous examples of British scientific and industrial prowess. Surgeons, mechanics, metallurgists, watchmakers, and five classical musicians who performed nightly. Gifts to the emperor included modern artillery pieces, a small steam engine, diamond-studded rich watches, and paintings. But the mission was a failure. In fact, the most popular showcase proved to be the classical musicians performing in the Chinese court. The Chinese bureaucracy was preoccupied with the demands for food in a society still stuck in an agrarian age and completely missed the point of the Industrial Revolution. All contraptions were brushed aside with polite condescension. The mission ended in humiliation of McCartney. He was called to the imperial seat one last time, only to receive a letter rejecting all of the mission's requests and an instruction to return to Britain. You see, it was simply preposterous that this backwater of rice farmers with their antiquated military thought they could place themselves in the global hegemony above the British Empire at the height of its supremacy. If the door to China remained closed, it would have to be battered down. And that's where I'm going to leave the video today. We will continue in the second part with the Opium Wars, which I think are rather entertaining.